good to see you this evening. Thanks for coming out. And a beautiful day. And just a wonderful day to serve the Lord, be in the Lord's house. Let me invite you to take your Bibles to the fourth chapter of John. John chapter 4 once again. Next week may be the last week we spend in this chapter, believe it or not. But we'll see. <clears throat> John chapter 4, our text goes from 39 to 45. Um, it's kind of a bridge text, um, but it's rich. Here's what the Bible says. From that city, that is Sychar, many of the Samaritans believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified, he told me all the things that I have done. So when the Samaritans came to Jesus, they were asking him to stay with them. And he stayed there two days. Many more believed because of his word. And they were saying to the woman, It is no longer because of what you said that we believe. For we have heard for ourselves and know that this one is indeed the Savior of the world. After the two days, he went forth from there to Galilee. For Jesus himself testified that a prophet has no honor in his own country. So when he came to Galilee, the Galileans received him, having seen all the things that he did in Jerusalem at the feast. For they themselves also went to the feast. Father, help us this evening as we spend some time in your word. Help me, give me grace to uh, do that which you have called me to do for this period of time. In Jesus' name, amen. So the text in front of us is in two pieces really we have the farewell to the woman at the well and the village of Sychar and then we have an entrance into Galilee and the welcome that Jesus receives there you remember as chapter 4 opens Jesus is going from Judea which is in the south to Galilee which is in the north and he winds up making a pit stop if you will at the well where most of chapter 4 takes place but now he's back on the road again now, John, the writer, has a great interest in the reactions to Jesus. And Jesus is never portrayed as anything less than a watershed figure in John's writings. Believe in him, love him, serve him, die for him, live eternally with him, or reject him, hate him. Serve your own lusts, die without him, and enter into eternal judgment. That's sort of the two categories that John places people into. Uh, and in 1 John especially, those categories are very apparent. John's gospel is written, you recall, that we might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing we might have life in his name. We come face to face with Jesus here in this gospel, and we are going to react into one of those two categories, at least eventually we are. And we'll talk a little more about that in a moment. Because John is also well aware of the fact that between the first encounters with Jesus and the time in which we reach one of those polar opposites of reaction, love, hate, belief, rejection, there may be, in between that time, a period of some superficial embrace, which can be rather confusing, to be perfectly blunt. We like things to be clear and simple, either it is or it isn't. Saying something isn't, but it looks like it is, can be kind of confusing. And so this is a rather confusing text, especially in verse 43 to 45. Now, there are two reactions to Jesus in the text before us, and they're really not quite as black and white as we'd like them to be, but all the indicators for where people are going to find themselves are there, and I think we'll see them as we go along. So to that end, our simple outline for this evening is, is simply belief matures in verse 39 to 42, and belief detours in verse 43 to 45. And so let's begin in verse 39, and they look at a belief in Jesus that matures, and that's personified by the villagers in the town of Sychar. John records a very interesting development in their faith, beginning in verse 39, where John writes this, From that city, 
Many of the Samaritans believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified, he told me all the things that I have done. Now when this lady understood and believed that she was talking with the Messiah, she left her water pot at the well, and we might well imagine that she ran back to the town of Sychar to tell the people to come back and see Jesus. Now, from the villagers' perspective, all they knew about Jesus was what this woman had told them. Jesus performed no miracles there in Sychar that we know of, save perhaps the miracle of knowing this lady's marital history. But she was absolutely convinced, no doubt because of the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit in her, she was convinced that Jesus was indeed the Messiah, and she told others that he was, and they believed her. They believed her, perhaps, because her life had been transformed, and they could see that in the first five minutes. Here's a lady that comes to a well in the middle of the day, so she doesn't have to see or talk to anybody, and now she's running into the town talking to as many people as she can find. Here's a lady who, no doubt, was as antagonistic to the people of the village as they were to her, but now she's reaching out to them. And here's a lady who almost certainly would not have been considered in the upper tier of religious zealots, but she's talking endlessly and breathlessly about the Messiah back at the well. Where does that come from? Whatever the reasons, the people of the town believed her. We know they believed her, because John says so, but we know they believed her because they made the hike to the well to go and see Jesus. And you don't really make that half mile, mile walk if you don't think there's something to it. So it seems that when the villagers approach Jesus at the well, they already have it in their minds and in their hearts who he is. For whatever reason, they trust this lady in the conclusion that she has reached. And as afternoon progresses into evening and, and the crowd now around the well uh, swells in number as the people sit in rapt attention listening to Jesus and talking with him and hearing him talk. And wouldn't you love to know what Jesus said to these people? In verse 40, they ask Jesus to stay with them. And he does for two days. Now, maybe this is the right place and maybe it's not, but let me just interject a word here about Jesus' time management. Because we're so driven by schedules and appointments and the general busyness of life, it's almost impossible to imagine a two-day detour like this. Jesus was going from point A to point B, but he took a two-day stop in the middle. Why did he stop? Because there's people here that are coming to faith in Christ, if you will. There's a revival going on in Sychar. Or maybe vival would be a better word, since revival means they'd been vived once, and they hadn't been vived for at least 10 centuries in the reign of Solomon. But at any rate, it seems the whole village is coming to faith in Jesus. And so he just stops here for two days. And I... I wonder how many times in our society, and this is just a part of the day and age in which we live, and I'm more guilty of this than anyone, but I wonder how many times we're so driven by our plans and our schedules that even if God had prepared an entire town to receive Christ, we couldn't take two days off unannounced to handle it. Maybe this is partly the flexibility of a prophet who doesn't have a business to run, or a family to feed, or responsibilities of that, that nature. And I get that, but Jesus did have some sort of plans to go into Galilee and teach and perhaps visit his family. And verse 44 indicates that he had put some thought into going to Galilee. And so these two days are interrupting his plans. Jesus' disciples, you remember, were very task-oriented like we are earlier in the chapter. They're off to get food. That's what Jesus sent them to do, and that's exactly what they're going to do. They're off to the village, village and buy food, and, and they come back, and, and now we're back. Jesus, you have to eat the food. I don't, I don't want to eat the food. What's, what's the matter? Why don't you want to eat the food? Did somebody else bring you the food? And they're all in a tizzy about... Jesus is not eating and their world is falling apart. Their, their schedule has come off the rails. 
throws the disciples all out of joint. Who's the guy that brought you food? You, you, you must have eaten something, Jesus. He said, go get food. Here's the food. Now you don't want the food. And, and there's no category in their minds that would indicate that something more important than eating might actually happen. But whatever Jesus had going on, it could wait. It wasn't more important than spending two days reaching this village with the gospel. When I was a sophomore in college, I was dating Shelly because I wrote to her about this. Strange thing happened to me. This never happened to me since, um, before or after. But at, at school there in the middle of the campus at Northland Baptist Bible College, there was a little white chapel and they had, it was a good fundamental Baptist institution. So you have to have a prayer meeting Wednesday night. And, and, and so we had one and we prayed for everybody's. When you're college kids, if you put 150 college kids in a room, do you know how many dying grandmas and grandpas there are? There's a lot of them. And we prayed for all of them. But one particular night, um, a fellow got up and preached, and he was not a particularly good preacher, and he did not preach a particularly good message. If, if I recall, he tore something from Proverbs terribly out of context. But, but as he preached, there was a sobriety that fell over, the, over the, all of us gathered there. And then when we went to pray, there was a seriousness and an intensity and a fervor that I'd never been a part of. And, and people began to repent and, and confess their sins. And, and, I, and we prayed and, and I went back to my dorm and about 10 minutes later, there's a knock on the door and says, you gotta come back. They're still praying and he's gonna come and, and talk again. And, and so I went back and, and we prayed and it was amazing. People just stood up and began confessing sins. I've never seen anything like it in my entire life. Curfew is at 9.30 and lights out is at 10. And here's a bunch of kids praying and, and here's a very rules oriented administration wondering what on earth to do. And the verdict came down something like this. If this is the work of God, he knows when we have to go to bed. And so we just wanted to sit and pray, but we don't have time to pray. We don't have time to bend the rules. And I remember being very disappointed and that the spirit of that night just sort of dissipated with the curfew and the lights out. And I missed that. It was a, it was a wonderful evening. Jesus was willing to take two days and just put everything on hold for the sake of this town. Now Jesus is about to leave and look at what the villagers say in verse 42 as Jesus walks away. They're speaking to the woman at the well, as we know her, and they say, quote, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves and know that this one is indeed the savior of the world. This is interesting. They believe back in verse 39, you see that. And when John uses the word believe there, I think he means they received Jesus and they became children of God in the John 1 12 sense. The word believe doesn't always mean that in John's gospel, nor its synonym receive. It doesn't mean got saved down in verse 45, or the ESV is welcomed. It's a little complicated, and we're a little unsure of the nature of the faith of the Samaritans in verse 39, but there's really no doubt about it in verse 42 when they say, we have heard for ourselves and know that this one is indeed the Savior of the world. And this is a wonderful example of what I would call the maturing of faith. The faith of these villagers begins rooted in the testimony of the woman at the well, but it ends rooted in the words of the Lord Jesus. You've heard it said before that faith is only as good as its object, right? Uh, you can be like the captain of the Titanic and have all the faith in the world that it can't sink and that there is no iceberg, but that baby's going down. Faith in lies is a faith that will let you down, will cause you to sink. Houses built on sand will fall when storms come. Faith in truth, on the other hand, will always serve you well. And this lady, to her credit, is ministering 
truth. She was absolutely correct. Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is the Messiah. He is God in the flesh. He is come to save this world from sin and death and the judgment of God. And they believed her. And because they believed the truth she told, their faith was a good faith. But there is a maturity to faith that grows from dependence upon this woman telling the truth to them to a dependence upon the truth itself, from words about Jesus to the words of Jesus, from the story about Jesus to the person of Jesus. I think it is that as parents, it's, it's this transition, uh, this maturity of faith that can make us nervous as we consider our children. I thank God that my kids all believe in Jesus, but I know that as they grow and mature, their, their faith is going to have to move from what Michelle and I have taught them about Jesus to the person of Jesus himself. The, the day is coming when they're going to look at the Bible and they're not going to say this is true because dad says it's true, but rather by God's grace, they're going to say this is true because Jesus has revealed to me that it is true. It doesn't mean that the faith of our children is flawed or faulty. It just means that it has growing to do. And sometimes we can get nervous about that transition because I've seen some that don't make that transition. Think of Jeremy who sat right behind me in first grade and and Alan, Paul's friend, who grew up knowing the truth of the gospel and are now hostile to it. And that makes us sad when faith doesn't mature and make that leap from, from we believed because of what you said, but now we believe because we have heard for ourselves. But know this too, when we share the gospel with others, we are asking them to believe us that we are telling the truth. And, and we do that and pray that Jesus will reveal the truth himself as well. But here you see these two levels of faith, one level being a faith in the woman's testimony and the other being faith rooted in the words of Jesus himself. I've even had the severe misfortune of seeing grown men who are by all external, God, by all external measures godly men loved their godly pastor and they fell into a life of sin and unbelief when their pastor was called away. And it pains my heart to know that, that their faith didn't mature from a belief in the words of a man to a devotion to the words of Christ. I don't fault a pastor and I don't fault the men of God who minister the gospel to these fragile believers, but it does break my heart to see the natural growth and maturity of faith aborted when that transition from the words and the uh, that transition from faith in the words of a messenger to the faith in the Lord Jesus himself is aborted. Now, faith itself is sort of a fluctuating thing. It sort of rises and falls. Salvation, on the other hand, is not. Regeneration does not fluctuate. Either you're born again or you're not. But faith itself, belief, to use John's word, is described as a thing which might be small, like a mustard seed. In Matthew 8.10, Jesus describes one man's faith as a great faith. And Jesus chastises his disciples as being of little faith or having a faith that is weak. Sometimes we speak of people of great faith or strong faith. John Bunyan created a character in Pilgrim's Progress by the name of Little Faith. And he barely had the strength to continue on his journey and every opposition that he faced nearly killed him and it was rather pitiful to read his story the way Bunyan portrayed him. We have to remember that our salvation does not exist apart from faith but neither does our salvation rest on the amount of faith we have. We can get a little theological here, but this is part of the reason that the reformers insisted that regeneration must precede or come before faith. Faith is a product of the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit. So while the faith of a believer may fluctuate and may change and may, in this case, mature, the fact that a person is regenerate means they will always have some measure of faith and also that 
that faith will over time and with the occasional backwards motion continue to increase and mature just as it grew and matured in the people of this village. I don't think we are to understand that these people were saved twice, once in verse 39 and again in verse 42. I don't think John even intends for us to think that they weren't really saved when they responded to the gospel from the lips of the woman at the well, but rather I think that their faith grow, grew and matured until it was rooted in the person of Christ. So they're not insulting this dear woman when, when they say, we don't believe because of you anymore, so take that. That's not what they're saying. They're expressing what I think would be pure joy to the ears of any evangelist. We don't believe because of what you said anymore. We believe because we've heard from Jesus. And we know for ourselves that he is indeed the savior of the world. We would probably be remiss to leave verse 42 without at least briefly addressing the title here, the Savior of the world for Jesus. It's used here and in 1 John 4, 14. And this is one of, our, this is one of those phrases where our theology has to drive our interpretation. And don't let that scare you. <coughs> Pardon me. But it's a phrase that's just potentially ambiguous enough to be understood several different ways. The Universalists claim that this verse and verses like it show that all people are going to eventually wind up in heaven. After all, Jesus is the Savior of the world, and if He is the Savior of the world, then the world is going to be saved. But that doesn't work, because Jesus is not only the Savior of the world, He's also the judge of the world. And that doesn't mean that Jesus is judging everyone, because there are some he is not going to judge, John 3. But it does mean this, at the least. It means that Jesus is the only Savior the world gets. There is no other Savior. I listened to a fascinating podcast this week. It was hosted by a radio host, unsaved. He had a Catholic background. And... Uh, He's from the city, Twin Cities area, but he was down in Topeka, Kansas, and he found a lady who uh, had moved from central Minnesota down to Topeka, Kansas, and she used to attend the Assemblies of God Church somewhere up in this area of the woods, I guess. But she was now a witch. But it was fascinating because as she was explaining the theology of paganism, she made it very clear that she did not need a savior. She said, we don't need salvation. She, in fact, she took what Pastor Ivan talked about this morning and twisted it in a very deadly way. Pastor Ivan talked about accepting responsibility. And she twisted that into a theology that said, we get ourselves out of our own messes. We don't need anyone to save us. We save ourselves. But there is only one Savior, and Jesus is it. There is no Savior hidden somewhere in the deep, dark recesses of your soul waiting to come out. This entire world has one Savior, Jesus Christ. Those who embrace Him by faith will be saved by Him. Those who deny Him and who reject Him will die without a Savior. And so the Samaritans here are embracing the exclusivity of Christ. It doesn't matter that he's a Jew and we're Samaritans. It doesn't matter that his people worship on that mountain and we worship on this one. He's the one Savior the world has, and we are embracing him. In Sunday school this morning, uh, adult Sunday school, we heard the phrase and learned the phrase that truth is a social construct. And we dispute that. But there was a time when our society, perhaps 50, 80 years ago, there was a time when our society at least generally agreed that Jesus was a Savior, and so it sort of generally accepted that truth. There was a general societal acknowledgement, at least, that Jesus is the one who saves. Now, what he saved us from was up for grabs. The social gospel said he saved us from injustice and inequality and the prosperity gospel said he saved us from poverty and illness and 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 some said he saved us from smoking cigarettes and playing cards and going to movies and 
And there's still many who rightly and well announce that Jesus saved us from the wrath of God. So we didn't all agree on what Jesus saved us from, but at least there was a consensus that Jesus saved from something. So we could at least have a discussion and a debate about what that was. But you won't find even that basic truth so readily believed anymore because the world has gone on. It has moved on to other saviors. Jesus has been relegated to the pantheon of modern saviors, or worse, placed in the museum of the saviors of the past. But the reality is, the truth is, and the Samaritans discovered this, there are no other saviors. So what do we as believers do? I, I think we just bang the same drum the Samaritans did. Jesus Christ is the savior of the world. It's Jesus who saves from sin from death and from judgment. There is no other way. You can't avoid death by eating organic. You can't escape sin by creating laws. And you can't escape judgment by electing Republicans. Those are false saviors. And people by the thousands, even people in the church, place their trust in them. So we present the true gospel from lives transformed by it so that those who hear us will believe us. Maybe we tire of hearing the charge that Christians are hypocrites, but whether or not that charge is true, the fact remains, nobody believes the word of hypocrites. And this lady was not a hypocrite, and they believed her. Perhaps God would be so gracious as to purge the church from those whose lives are not transformed by the power of the gospel. And people don't believe their word because their lives aren't transformed and they have no faith to mature into a faith in Christ. But this is a fascinating picture of the maturing of faith here in verse 39 to 42. Now we're going to change gears and look at belief detours in verse 43 to 45. Uh, a detour is when you leave the road, your destination is... that You leave the road that leads to your destination, and for whatever reason, you take a different one. Um, verse 43 to 45 are extremely difficult to interpret because of verse 44. This is one of those texts that has as many proposed interpretations as interpreters. My kids were almost laughing at me last night. I had the kitchen table half covered in books trying to figure out verse 44. And every book that I had had a different opinion of what to do with verse 44. And I'm not going to pretend to be able to solve the mystery that has plagued good and godly men of far superior intellect and wisdom, but I'll at least try to acquaint you with the issues so you can ponder them. Now, in verse 43, Jesus leaves Sychar and moves to Galilee. That's, that's easy. So far, so good. In verse 44, John says this, For Jesus himself testified that a prophet has no honor in his own country. Now, let me just try to simplify things a little bit, try to define one thing up front, and then we'll move on from there. We'll try to solve one riddle. The last word of verse 44, you see there, is the word country. Or if you have an ESV, it's the word hometown. The Greek word here is patris, which is related to father. It's where we get patria, or, or pater is the Greek word. Patria is Latin. Um, patristic, patriarch, it's, it's that word. Uh, so some translators will even use the word fatherland. Now, all sorts of suggestions have been made for what this country or hometown or fatherland might be. I think the most natural way to understand it is that he's speaking of Galilee itself. Jesus is from Galilee, the north country of the land of Israel. So it's pretty natural, I think, that Jesus is referring to Galilee here as his country. That's where he's going. Um, though the ESV translation, hometown, could narrow that down a little further just to Nazareth itself. And some of the old commentators say, well, Jesus uh, is going to go to Galilee in general, but not Nazareth. He's going to avoid that. There's no honor there. Uh, Nathaniel says in chapter 1 that Jesus is from Nazareth. 
Some have suggested Jesus is referring to Judea. After all, he was born there, and earlier in chapter 4, he just left there. Some have even suggested that that word refers to heaven, which is, in a real sense, Jesus' own country and fatherland. But most naturally, it refers to Galilee, and I think we can settle there uh, for the purposes of our study tonight. But that does present a problem, and that is this. There is no honor for a prophet in his own country. That's a proverb. Directly applied to Jesus, it sounds like this. Jesus doesn't receive any honor in Galilee, but where's he going? He's going to Galilee. And what happens when he gets there in verse 45? Well, he's welcomed. He's received. So this is a bit of a quandary. And to complicate matters just a little further, the first word in verse 44 is, or should be, the word for which gives, Jesus, or gives the reason that Jesus is doing what he's doing. It's a causal word. Jesus is going into Galilee because that's his homeland, and he's not going to get any honor there. Now, the NIV translators had such a difficult time trying to make any sort of sense of this verse that they just put verse 44 in parenthesis and tossed the first word aside completely. The ESV translators put it in parentheses, so you can sort of disconnect it from verse 43 and verse 45. And the New American translators put all the words in there and just hope somebody could come along and make some sense of it. So here's, here's the way it reads, if we accept that Galilee is the country or the hometown in mind. Something like this. After the two days, Jesus went forth from Sychar into Galilee because Jesus himself testified that as a prophet, he had no honor in Galilee, and so when he came to Galilee, the Galileans received him, having seen all the things he did in Jerusalem at the feast. So we have two big problems. One, what on earth would cause Jesus to go to a place where he knew he wouldn't be honored, and in fact, he went there because there was no honor for him there? That's not easy to unravel. It's really difficult to get inside the head of Jesus, to get inside the motives of the Son of God, and the Bible doesn't give us much help here. It's been suggested that Jesus makes a prophecy. There's no honor in my own country, and so he prophesies, and then he goes in and proves it. That's what John MacArthur says. Um, a good brother by the name of Hendrickson suggests that Jesus is leaving Judea because the heat is getting cranked up. The Pharisees are turning on him. There's an inevitable conflict coming, and Jesus knows that the hour of his death has not yet arrived, and so he's just going to go to a place where nobody really, really think twice about him and just leave him alone. It's better to be ignored and left alive than to be noticed, hated, and killed prematurely. And no less than Don Carson suggests that Jesus is avoiding any sense of division or competition between himself and John the baptizer. After all, in the end of chapter 3 and the beginning of chapter 4, it's clear that Jesus is beginning to overtake John as the most popular prophet in the nations and to put an end to any sort of competition and comparison and seeming rivalry. Jesus just leaves to a place where he's not going to be fussed over. And so there's all these things that have been proposed as trying to understand why Jesus went to a place where he knew there would be no honor. But at any rate, that's where he's going, to a place where by his own testimony he will receive no honor. But the second problem is that when he shows up in verse 45, they roll out the red carpet for him. The Galileans receive him. So, so what in the world is going on here? As if it wasn't hard enough to figure out Jesus' rationale, when he does show up, it seems to backfire in his face. There's no honor here. He shows up, and they roll out the red carpet. And he say, well, you sure blew that one, Jesus. The phrase, the Galileans received him in verse 45, needs to be more carefully considered, because we've heard things like this before, and we will again. In fact, verse 45 ought to sound eerily familiar to us. Look back at chapter 2, verse 23, which finds Jesus in Jerusalem, surrounded by crowds of admirers. Listen to what John says here. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name, observing his signs, which he was doing. 
But Jesus, on his part, was not entrusting himself to them, for he knew all men. And because he did not need anyone to testify concerning man, for he himself knew what was in man. Now, here in chapter 2, Jesus can see something behind the belief that he doesn't trust. There's a fatal flaw to the belief in chapter 2. Can you see it there? Many believed in his name, observing his signs, which he was doing. Now listen to chapter 4, verse 45 again. The Galileans welcomed him, having seen all that he had done in Jerusalem at the feast. That's the same fatal flaw. It is faith based on a miracle. Now Jesus has, I think, a, and I hope you forgive me for saying it this way, a rather conflicted and complicated relationship to his miracles. His miracles validated his claims of deity. His miracles were powerful evidence that he was who he said he was. But there was a downside to the miracles too, if we can say it that way. We tend to think, perhaps, of Jesus' miracles as humanitarian missions. A wedding is out of wine, so quick, save the day and, and make some more. A man's son is dying here in the end of chapter 4. Heal him so he doesn't die. This man is going to be sad if his son dies. And, and he's, his, his mom is going to be crying. And we, Jesus, you can stop that. Another man in chapter 5 can't get to, into the pool in time to be healed. And he has no friends to help him, but Jesus helps him. In chapter 6, 5,000 men, not counting women and children, are out in the countryside without any food. And so Jesus feeds them. But there's another side to all of these. Jesus chides his mother at the wedding in a way that we almost have to make excuses for him. We get the sense that Jesus isn't very happy about the expectations of him here in the end of chapter 4. Almost like he heals with a sigh, which isn't quite true, but there is a troubled heart behind that miracle. It's pretty clear. We'll look at that next week. In chapter 5, there's an entire host of people around that pool that Jesus does not heal. And in chapter 6, those whom he feeds lunch chase him halfway around the Sea of Galilee, begging him for breakfast, and he won't give it to them. So I take it here in 4 verse 45 that there's a difference between honoring a prophet as one who speaks the words of God and receiving and welcoming and celebrating a local miracle worker. Jesus is going to be, I, I think, uh, welcomed and received, but that's not the same as saying that he's honored. And if that seems like a rather minor point, Jesus draws himself draws a pretty sharp line and as we'll see in chapter 8 if we ever get there that that line is actually as sharp as life and death. And so to the degree that Jesus was cautious and careful with the reactions to his miracles and and really had no use for those who admired his miracles but ignored his words. I think we need to think carefully about our own relationship to and what we expect from the Lord Jesus. We live in a world where the supernatural exists. God is real. Angels are real. Miracles happen. There is a power that is unlike anything that we possess a power that transcends what we call natural law and can turn natural law on its head. Children like we find in the end of chapter 4 who are deathly ill don't just recover in a moment. Men like we find in chapter 5 crippled for 38 years don't suddenly start running and jumping. Bodies lying in graves, decomposing for the better half of a week, like we find in chapter 11, don't just walk out. But Jesus can make that happen. But that's 
not to say that we celebrate Jesus because he can fix our problems. We don't worship him because we hope he's going to heal us when we're sick or heal our loved ones when they're sick. He could, and he might, but he might not. The question is, what do we make of Jesus when he doesn't do what he could do or what we want him to do? Do we love him then? Do we worship him then? Do we honor him as the one who does all things good when the natural runs its course and the supernatural never shows up? It's my contention that the moment a believer dies for all of eternity, that person lives in the full awareness and consciousness of the natural and the supernatural. Faith becomes sight and all things that are unseen will be seen. But until that day, it seems as though God has, for reasons best left to him, ordained that, generally speaking, we live by faith in this natural world, loving, serving, following, and honoring Jesus in the absence of any steady stream of miracles. There's a kind of thinking that since we love Jesus and we are loved by Jesus, we ought to have some sort of access to his power. One of the common words in Christianity is the word unleash. God's power, the thinking goes, is on some sort of leash. We just have to figure out how to unleash it so it can come and make our lives what we wish they were. Jesus doesn't seem to have time for that kind of faith. He's a miracle worker, yes, but, but his miracles are done on his time and in his way. You really don't get the sense from John's gospel or the Bible in general that anyone ever unleashes Jesus. <laughs> Jesus leashes and unleashes himself as he wishes. So this is one of those ironic statements in verse 45. When Jesus comes to Galilee, the Galileans received him. But their reception was based on seeing all the things that he did in Jerusalem at the feast. For they themselves also went to the feast. There is a kind of faith in Jesus that is a faith in what Jesus can do for me to be what I really want, to give me what I want. We all have desires. We talked this morning about uh, 1 John, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of possessions. And anyone with the power that Jesus has is able to get those for me. Because frankly, some of those are just out of our reach. That Ferrari, I still can't afford it. <laughs> but Jesus has enough money that he could probably swing it for me. Okay? And there is a kind of faith in Jesus that is a faith that he will be what I want him to be. But that kind of reception is not honor. And Jesus is going to Galilee. He's going to be received. But he's not going to be honored. There's a celebration of his ability to work miracles. But there's not an honor that says, this is the Son of God. There's something of the wonder of a local boy who's making a name for himself and has wonderful abilities, but there's not the respect that this is the Son of God. Instead, they say, we know your mom. <laughs> we, know your, we know your brothers and sisters. We know that you're, you're neat, but you're really not that special. And so here we have faith that takes a detour. It, it begins in the direction of Christ, but it veers off, instead of honor for Christ, into a welcoming of Jesus as a miracle worker who can give us all the things we already wanted in the first place. So here we have faith matured and faith that takes a detour. Next week, Lord willing, we will look at the healing of the nobleman's son and finish up chapter four. Father, thank you for...
our time together in this word, a rather difficult text, but thank you for uh, the patience of these folks to wade through this and, and think through and ponder the complicated nature of, of faith, complicated by our own sin and our own sinful desires, complicated by an enemy who twists and distorts all things to lead to destruction. So we thank you for the Spirit who comes and clarifies things so we can know Christ. Help us, help our faith to mature and help us to uh, 